Lawrence Hutchman was born in Belfast, Ireland in 1948 and spent his early childhood there. He was affected by the poetry of Ireland even at that early age. He sensed it in the language and the land. Also, his father loved to tell stories and write, recite poems. Then at seven, he and his mother lived part of the year in, their, in her native Holland. Her Dutch family was into painting. He remembers watching his uncle painting windmills and wanted to be a painter himself. Uh, later, as an adult, Hutchman became known for his poetry of landscape, his ability to draw the reader into the details of the world he is evoking in the, to the point where they feel they have been there themselves. When Lawrence was still a young boy, the family moved to Canada, which represented untold possibilities for him not to be bound by the past, but to be able to experience the potential of ever-changing life along with the other people who came from different parts of the world. People who brought with them their own new ideas. When he was nine, the family moved to Emory, Ontario, which was a place on the border of the country and the city, a place in transition from the world of the old to the new. It was an exciting time because he had the freedom to roam through the fields, along the hills, through the orchards. And I myself can relate to this as I grew up in the country and moved to the city while I was quite young. But unlike Lawrence, I never went back later to see what the adult reality of the place was. Whereas uh, he searched for and interviewed the farmers from the Emory area and discovered the history of the place. And many poems came out of that research, published in his collection called Emory, 1998. During his high school years in Emory, Lawrence remembers borrowing a James Joyce novel from the public library and being so strongly affected by Joyce's extraordinary use of language that he decided to become a writer himself. By the time he finished high school, he had written some award-winning poetry and his first novel. In the late 60s, Lawrence Hutchman came to UWO to begin his education in English literature. He recalls London as being alive with poetry then. Michael Ondaatje, James Rini, and Don Mackay were all on the UWO faculty and producing exciting original books. The first poetry reading Lawrence had ever attended was at Talbot College starring Irving Layton and Earl Burney. Uh, Leighton was at his height at the time, and after, reading, after the reading, Lawrence engaged him in a conversation about the qualities that make a poet. A lot of us would have liked to have heard that. <laughs> in his freshman year at Western, Lawrence was appointed editor of the School Literary Journal, and he and another poet organized a series of readings. He remembers Don Mackay giving a brilliant linguistic imitation of a motorcycle while reading his poem called Yamaha. <clears throat> and by the way, uh, Don Mackay will be reading right here two weeks from now for Poetry London. Um, <clears throat> Lawrence says, we sometimes forget how much these writers, in their almost anonymous way, were beginning to create an awareness of literature and its importance in the local, regional, and national culture. While at, U at UWO, he published his first book of poetry called The Twilight Kingdom and graduated in 1972. Since then, Lawrence Hutchman went on to complete his MA at Concordia and his PhD at the University of Montreal in 1988. He has taught at a number of universities, including Western, and for the final 22 years of his teaching career, taught at the University of Moncton, from which he has recently retired. 
So far, Hutchman has seven books of poetry to his credit. His awards include the Alden Nolan Award for Excellence in English Language Literary Arts, 2007, and first prize poetry category in the Writers' Federation of New Brunswick Literary Competition, as well as others. His collection called Beyond Borders, published in 2000, gave him a large place in New Brunswick literature. In it, he wrote about Edmonston, both its natural and human landscapes, and concluded that we should look to see commonalities, not differences, and that there is no clear distinction between where one place or time ends and another begins. For his latest book, in the writer's words, Conversations with Eight Canadian Poets, published in 2011. Hutchman interviewed eight of the major Canadian poets of the 1950s era, who were then on a mission to establish a national Canadian poetry. He shows how these modernist writers, such as P.K. Page, Al Purdy, Louis Dudick, and James Reaney, laid important foundations for future, future poets. When asked about his own personal preference in poetic style, Hutchman said this, I like the longer expansive poem, which has its roots in British Romanticism, the kind of organic poem which almost grows out of itself, which seems so natural and spontaneous, but at the same time has a hidden powerful structure in it. I think because of the vastness of our land, the openness of space and form. This is a kind of poem that we can appreciate and nourish. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Lawrence Hutchman. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming to this event. Thank you, Stan. I know what it takes to run a poetry series and it's a very demanding job. I think you've done a remarkable one with this series. Rarely have I had such um, preparation for a reading in terms of uh, uh, internet exposure, photos, interviews. That's, that's great. I wish I could give you the sense of what it was like to be a student in the 1960s at Western and the early 70s. It was a very exciting time. I remember passing between those two big pillars at the, at the, the gates of the university and thinking, this is really going to be something. And it was. It was incredible, incredible years that I spent here. Um, the readings, Leighton, Wojnarzewski, Alden Nolan, so many others, and the uh, excellent professors I had, including I'm, I'm very proud to say, Professor Don Hensley, who's here tonight. Can you stand up, Don? Don was a very demanding professor, and uh, he was very, uh, very encouraging throughout not only my first year there, second year, but also uh, ever since, basically. And uh, so it's great to have you here, Don. Sometimes it's difficult being a writer at university 
I don't know how many lectures I missed because of Dostoevsky, Stendhal, <laughs> Whitman. I'd be going to an English lecture, and I'd suddenly discover leaves of grass, and that was it. So I was, I was in this constant kind of pull between the academic and the creative. And I haven't still mastered that uneasy balance. But uh, I struggled with it. You may remember that, Don. We had many discussions about that in, in Don's small office on the, on the third floor, crammed with Wordsworth and Coleridge and all kinds of other incredible romantic material. There were some times, for instance, midterm, and I would say, why is a professor asking these questions? I'd have this kind of Woody Allen moment, you know. <laughs> One such moment occurred when I was um, asked a question about Yeats' vision. And I thought, how am I going to answer this? And I thought, I know what I'll do. I'll try a variation of the Spencerian stanza. and write in Popian couplets. I think that will do just fine. <laughs> so this turned out to be a, um, a satire of, uh, of uh, the poem. I know Larry Garber was very amused with it. And uh, they told the story for years afterwards to the students. <laughs> Fortunately, in the second half of the third year, I had, uh, I had the privilege of studying with Arthur Barker, a great Milton scholar. Western was very fortunate in having two great Milton scholars, Rajan and Arthur Barker. And I buckled down and wrote, I thought, finally, an excellent essay on Milton's Paradise Lost. So it was an incredible time. I'm happy to be back. I should add that when I graduated from the University of Montreal in, um, in uh, 1998, I came back to teach at Western for a year, which was one of the most amazing experiences of my career. I really enjoyed being at Western, and it was a joy to teach students here, and to work alongside uh, my colleague, like Don Hensley. I was privileged to be able to see from both sides, or even three sides, or as Penny might say, multi-sides, right? <laughs> many, many. So I've, I'm, really, I'm really excited to be back in London again, because I, the, the London gave me so much as, a, as an undergraduate, you know? And, uh, and uh, so it's great to be here. Now to the poetry. I could talk about an hour about all things that, that are longer about what happened here. But it's such an incredible place with the meeting with Andachi and how, oh, that's not our time. <laughs> OK. Um, this is a Facebook poem. I call it a Facebook poem because it started off as an entry on Facebook. Um, and I started writing this complaint about winter on Facebook, and suddenly it turned into a poem. But the, the strange, the kind of weird thing happened was that I finished the poem very quickly, didn't quite realize it was a poem, and posted it before I, and I realized, oh no, I've just posted a poem. And I, it's the original poem, right? Well, I thought. And uh, anyway. This is the poem, which doesn't mean changed that much. But it's called, oh, it's such a topical poem. Woke up the other day and there's snow, and I go, what's, what gives with this? This is snow, right? You know, is Christmas coming again? Or what, what's happening? Waiting for spring. What is it about waiting for spring? As you look at disbelief at the white pages of the calendar, long past the vernal equinox, you've been waiting for a long time looking out into the backyard as if it were the frozen form of an agia, trying to reshape itself in time-lapse photography. 
Yes, you've been waiting for the signs for some time now. The subtle bright change in the afternoon sky in late January, that moment when you sit in the escort and feel that momentary warmth, the first you sense since late October. You feel the belief in a minor meteorological prophecy, the assurance of the wa wavering rays of the sunlight. There's the thin hope of the slow lengthening evenings. Count them, two minutes per day. But you're a long way from daylight savings time in the deep freeze of February. And then suddenly, in spite of the frozen air, you see water on the street, the first since God knows when, but you're grateful. And then you have the pavement becoming a tabula rasa, white and so dry. Surely spring must come now, or soon, despite the days of blizzards and shovel and sweat. Then the chains, the thermometer surprisingly climbs above zero, and those glacial snowbanks start to slowly melt, and you watch for patterns, the unexpected emergence of grass and its widening swath, ever slow diminishing of the snow. Why don't you live on the sunny side of the street? The snow begins to undergo alterations that moves into old age. You see the crystals begin to form and little prisms appear. Every object now has an identity. The trees have no snow and the roofs are finally bare. Nature becomes lyrical, the water gurgling under little snow glaciers which have been begun to turn brown like tawny animals. Remember on the way home from school when you used to break them off, sometimes 10 feet at a time. You were a nice breaker. Remember when the coming of spring used to be fun? But you can see the discontent of winter is still in the air as neighbors go outside and can't believe that CNN is wrong again. And, still, and they are still scraping off the morning frost. You see them out there with their pickaxes and choppers hacking away at their personal glaciers as if they were a private affront. They stand like desperate Shakespearean actors looking at the enigmatic spring skies, giving their soliloquies, where art thou now, O spring? And you wait and listen for the birds. came back from Cuba, and the leaves weren't on the trees, and they were all sort of the playoffs. <laughs> <laughs> um, lifeguard. <laughs> no, I like it. I like the accompaniment. <laughs> like a Cuban song. <laughs> I love that Cuban music. <laughs> Sorry for embarrassing you, Cuba. Because my Laurel and Hardy skit. <laughs> Don, I have to make another. Uh, confession here. This poem might not have been written without you because remember that day you said you should read this book. It's called The Orphic Voice by Elizabeth, Elizabeth Sewell, right? Chapter six or seven, there's a mention of the German poet Rilke. I thought, wow, this is an amazing poet, Rilke. So, and this poem maybe something changed my life in some ways. But I thought it was the first poem, and I wrote it here in London, you know, I was, I know, when I was a lifeguard. Lifeguard. The bricks have never been so red. The sky is blue as it was in the beginning. A clear pastel eternity. The clouds are fantastic swirls, feelings. The brilliant grass glimmers through the fence, and I must watch this lonely swimmer, 10 years old and struggling in the shallow water. Look, I can almost touch bottom. Go away. I want to be with Rilke. Go away and leave me alone with the sky. He is panting, gurgling, 
laughing, asking questions, and then breaks the surface with a frightened stare. There the clouds, fence, trees, and red bricks. Go away, I want to be with Rilke. I look at him in the water. I am looking at Rilke. <laughs> I've heard you like that poem. I kind of like that poem, eh? <laughs> yeah, I like it so much I wrote it for myself. <laughs> oh. You like it too, eh? <laughs> um, spoon. To practice poems, hold the spoon, feel the weight of the metal on your fingertips, the way the bubble shows the carpenter a level of the line. To practice poems, try to ignore the noises of children. You cannot ignore the children's noises, but hold the spoon. Your son is also looking for a spoon. Look at its lines, how well they are shaped to its tapered form the long neck opening out into the elliptical head. Observe how the lines circle the metal like natural striations for not of the earth, but the movement of the mouth and fingers upon it. Observe the peculiar color of rust and silver. Ignore the crests and words, although you cannot fail to see this is an Irish hotel with a royal crown crest on opposite sides. To practice poems, you must hold the spoon more consciously than you would a pen, feel its form and its smooth function. Observe, too, how the form is not of the earth, but transformed from the metal out of the earth, deep fires millions of years before. If you want to practice poems, put the spoon into your mouth. Feel your lips around it, sounds, shapes, textures, flavors, feel how it nourishes you with its meats, vegetables, and fruit, how it takes them from the earth into you. I like Frank O'Hara's quotation that, that poetry should be at least exciting as the movies. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think sometimes we, that's what we aim for. I was watching Julie Jim go to soir. I really like this film because it just, there's a magic about it, you know, it just, films in the 1960s and that are incredible, you know, we've lost something, we've lost literature in films, I mean, they talk about Baudelaire and love and, and Jean Miro talking about uh, Les Femmes Pétales and leaving off middle of the year saying, I protest into the Seine, you know, amazing films, incredible. Okay, this is not a film. It's a prose poem, actually, but it's kind of like a film. Just imagine yourself rolling, listening back, the click, 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 the screen ahead, you know, there it is, the poem being projected, you know. This is my father, he worked at Codex. So we, we, we were always being filmed with our kids, you know. We, were, we thought we were kind of movie stars, but most of the time we were embarrassed. <laughs> Midnight. My favorite hour. How comfortable to sit here listening to the refrigerator humming, the syncopation of the clock, the midnight bus breaking, the warming up of an orchestra. After a long day's journey, I reach the shore and look out on sleep's dark breakers. Today we painted a wall. Not much, mind you, but those old green flowers are finally gone. We can hang pictures there. I keep back to midnight, not the beach, but the wide red table that spreads before me like a mesa. In the landscape are walnuts, green grapes, Spider-Man, and the wooden Russian dolls. My thought steps. I step outside myself. I am the stranger walking by the sea. Midnight, my favorite hour when the refrigerator is an Arctic piano. After the hockey game last night, I drove out into the unrecognizable Mauve City. On the mountain edge, the boy and girl drank danced and sang into the wind. 
On the edge, be near the power, not the guarding of thought. Be the stranger, the reader. Come, the scherzo is over. Already the drum of the clock is fading and the piano plays softly like a cardiogram. Listen, the night, late night bus revelers, the voices of sleep. The clock steps draw you closer to the waves. Fatigue like a friend takes you into the weird night childhood. Now, after traveling all day, we learn the world. Stranger, the sea is here. Forget and welcome. I live on the border. I've always lived on the border. Different states, Canada, Quebec, New Brunswick. Passing through customs. If you can understand the difficulty of traversing customs and the questions, where are you from, where are you going? As you wait in the drizzling rain for the train to move on, then you can cross the tracks into another country. If you can move beyond the sensations of your skin and the hard edges of your mind into some wilder, dangerous terrain, and if you can permanently break with your old physical idea of order to see the weaving grasses, then you can navigate these streets and head out into open country. If you can move beyond the politics of blood, the tyranny of signs, and if you can break with what you consider taste and touch the rain as if it were your thought, then you can move into that other country. If you can get beyond the idea of borders, pass through these customs, then you would discover the integrity of bridges, the originality of streams, the fecundity of ponds, and you would move among the enduring mountains through the valley that holds countries together. So, I like ekphrastic po poems. Sorry about that word, as, as Barry Dempster says. Like he said, what is ekphrastic? It sounds like a car accident. <laughs> it's poems about art and, and uh, sculpture, and so on. And this is a poem about Vermeer's. Uh, La Dantelier, the lace maker, it's hanging in the Louvre. I walk about four o'clock in the morning to write this in a little hotel on the south bank of Paris. And he says, another four o'clock poem. Right? I know those turbulent times. You get up and you're saying, what the hell am I doing up at this time? And the page says, you're writing me, that's what. <laughs> A dental year. Bent over your lace, everything in your body draws me toward your hands. I can feel the tension as you pull the strands of thread. The way you bend is your inclination to thread the form of fabric. Your cheeks and hidden smile, if it is a smile at all, are directed to the point in the sewing of the blue cloth. So I observe you concentrating on the point of the pattern you make. I feel the motion of your hands, forearms, shoulders, threading your life, forgetting about children, family, history, weaving them through your fingers. How Vermeer has poised your elegant fingers, your needle suspended in perfect tension. I look at you in that gold and white dress. The blue fabric is so tactile, I could run my finger over it. Lace maker, you spin fabric out of yourself. Draw me into the flowers of the sun as you float there, alive to the graceful interaction of work and life. I'll change the subject for a while. New subject. We were asked to write about one of the seven deadly sins. I chose lust. This is a poem about lust. Lust. Have you ever really thought of the word lust? A scrabble of the libido. Let the word roll on your tongue. 
The long L is a liquid curving phi. The U has the rich taste of a sexual vowel and the ending st, a closing of the lips. Rhyme the word with lust, with bust. Yes, it doubles. Must is that inevitability of desire. Turn it around and there's a hidden slut. Where there's a tussle, that ultimate tussle with nocturnal fantasies, lust. It's more than the word, a desire that's in us, between the goalposts of the L and the T. How is the language gives rise to lust? Say the word. Imagine them through the negligee of language, the amber moonshine, the midnight delta, the hidden harbor, the lighthouse, the peninsula in light, geography of desire. painting for my partner Eva who <clears throat> changed my life how is it that you are able to paint light or ask us to reconsider what light is, or rain. The spectrum of the rain breaking up into unrecognizable shapes of the city in their fractured neon bursts. And it seems the light is raining, or is it raining light? And we pause to listen in the continual jazzy night. How do you break up the wetness of air and the silvery sheen lines? into the explosive red traffic lights or the yellow scepter of lamps. How you paint the water's ebb and flow as if you, it is you looking at water until it becomes part of you. When you paint the landscape, you draw us into a pale meditative sky. And finally, November blues. Then glut thy sorrow on a morning rose or on the rainbow of the salt sand wave. John Keats. November, dark, short months so long, half season between the holiday of remembrance and that of holy birth. I waken with sad circular thoughts that do not reach beyond themselves. There is no clear waking, but a pervasive mist that shrouds my early mor morning rituals. Neither the warm Brazilian coffee, its image of lighted leaves in the rainforest, the aromatic raisin and cinnamon bagels, or the friendly smiling Quaker with his hearty oats, no. These don't make me feel better. Shadows push against shadow, dreams who play themselves like daylight myths. My body, in spite of sleep, does not renew itself, but mood can change, like the sharp autumnal weather. For nothing can foresee what changes will take place. So is that not always the challenge, to find the joy in darkness in the face of death? as Keats found in his flight to the nightingale. Light is the other side of darkness in this coin. In the lines of the poetry, the poet becomes nature, then art in its reflection of our mortal state reveals its power and transforming energy. It is here at the end of the afternoon that I see the sun for the first time today making a corona of the clouds, 
showing all the tones of whites and grays. If I could capture that scene in my painting, it would be the light I need. Now, when I look toward the bright evening sky, I see these small dark dreams are only part of the whole. I remember the old books in my pine bookcase. I remember meeting innocent Barbara at the school dance and how the songs of rock and roll revived me. The powerful beauty of Beethoven's Seventh Symphony. Miles Davis' extemporaneous notes in this blue November. I feel the sudden presence of Eva, the tenderness of her touch, which wakens me to the brightness of a November sun. Yes? Your poem about the spoon. Mm -hmm. About nine or ten years ago, I'm not sure, Patrick Lean was here. Mm -hmm. And he uh, was talking about a workshop that he did where he assigned the students to write a poem about a spoon. Oh, yes. And then he proceeded to, he was a very beautiful about the spoon that he did. I just wondered, were you in that workshop? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I've taken a course of Patrick Lane, but I never heard him talk about his spoon or the spoon. You know. So um, I wasn't in that workshop. Yeah. Yes? Do I stand up? <laughs> Whatever. You feel comfortable? Um, stand up. No, okay. About your poem last, you're not just um, with the rhyming. Yeah, words that rhyme with us, but it's sort of done in rhythm. And I really like that. The rhyming and the... Yeah, the rhyming, how it's not just the word, it's sort of like... Yeah. It's kind of done in rhythm, like, I, yeah. I see that myself. Kind of language, I think as Robert Duncan has mentioned in Roots and Branches, he's, it, language is filled with rhyme, and the, the f rhyme is not just terminal line. Uh, you know, some t teachers have this terminal kind of mentality, which the rhymes are at the end of the line, right, you know, and the rhyme is at the end of the line, and that's it, there's nothing else that rhymes, and take your time, and that's it. <laughs> Irish yeah, for sure. Anyway, the rhyme is at the beginning. You have an initial rhyme, you have end rhyme, you've got middle rhyme, you've got rhymes, you have got phonological rhymes or rhymes of sounds all the way through. It's called, often it's called euphony or alliteration uh, or assonance, but you have this kind of flicker all the way through. The, um, and also little phrases of rhyme, like in the spoon and the sun, and the sun is in the spoon and, and so forth. Mm -hmm. All of these kind of flickerings or kind of echoes or resonances of a sound. Uh, so sound, so rhyme, and it's hard to get get teachers away from that, that kind of fixation with rhyme, because rhyme is also it's in the sounds themselves. It's in the kind of the movement or the kinesthesia, the kind of jostling, the dancing of the uh, of the sounds. You have also syntactical rhyme. So in the poet like Milton, uh, the syntax. Has, has a kind of repetitive quality, especially that very beautiful and tragic, poignant intermingling of noun, or pronouns in that speech with Adam and Eve. God bless you, uh, Arthur Barker. <laughs> with this beautiful speech in which um, Adam is trying to repair himself, apologize to Eve, and he talks about these beautiful interchange of, 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 of um, pronouns, but it's also there's a rhyme there. We have also formal rhyme, but the rhyme of st stanzas, like the Spenserian stanza, is also a kind of rhyme. That's a visual rhyme. So rhymes, when one's a writing, one's aware of all po possibilities of rhymes and trying. And if you're a really good poet, you just open up yourself to that kind of electromagnetic field in which the kind of the rhymes, like tennis balls on Walt Disney animation, <laughs> are all there, but not quite so random in the random universe. But because rhyme is structure, and we love structure. We like to have, like our whole Whitman's talk about the sea and, and so forth. These are incredible sense of rhymes, you know. And when we're writing this poem, when we write poems, when we're not writing with our head, because we can't only write with our heads, um, we're writing with um, that beautiful interplay of um, 
mind and body or, and feelings and thought, you know. So I think the possibilities that arrive are really, really endless. But one of the things, that, one of the problems I think is if it's too loose, if the structure is too loose, and there's not a, and if the, there's no real structure there, then you don't have tension. You, and the poem always needs a certain tension. Without a tension, without a formal tension, even when you're at your most spontaneous, there's a tension there. And rhyme can give you that. Sounds can give you that. And the way you structure your lines, your rhyme breaks and so forth, can give you that thing. So that's a very kind of beautiful sense of um, um, rhyme. We, you know, it's, we can learn so much by going back to traditional poetry to get that kind of formal excellence that, that, uh, that I try to try to get in my poems, like the spoons on it. The poem doesn't rhyme. Some student says, there's no rhyme in this poem. I said, you didn't, read, you didn't hear the poem. You know? <laughs> the poem is filled with rhyme, as our lives. And as any normal Irishman can tell you, you know, it's uh, <coughs> Irish, you know, they, they talk in rhyme. They have this wonderful lingo. I once tried walking away with somebody's uh, chime. I don't know why I was taking it. Probably to provoke her, but and I heard his voice. Where's your aunt fella going with that wee thing? <laughs> <laughs> so you have this this beautiful sense of rhythmic language that's with us, you know. And um, and that's we want to use all those possible resources of the language, language and, while still keeping the idea that we're very kind of spontaneous. And yes, <laughs> yes. Um, I'm currently an undergraduate at Western. I'll have the good fortune to take a class with Larry Garber next year, and I was wondering. Um, the almost necessity of compromising and sort of creative outpouring in order to accord to the academic sphere. And I was wondering how you were able to do that. Um, that's a tough one. I think I think at some point you've got to say, I'm here for writing essays. And, and you have to learn the essay form. That's, that's a big thing. I think your creativity will, will naturally come, come around, and you won't have to sacrifice that. If you concentrate on, uh, when you're in university, on the, form, the formalities, the, uh, the other part will, will come back. It's very difficult, I think, for I found it very difficult, and I really didn't start writing until I finished my undergraduate, like serious poems, mm -hmm. and the lifeguard happened just about a month after I, I graduated, you know, once I was free, but I needed to, I, I really needed because of what I did in my future life um, is to have that formal uh, discipline. Uh, so yeah, I would say that you need to have the formal discipline. It's, 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 it's so necessary. But whatever you do, don't lose the, the spark, the excitement, the unpredictable, you know, a thing that makes you breathe, you know. And that, that, that's what, what you don't want to lose. And if academia is killing you, you know, Go somewhere else for a while. I did it. I dropped out for two years. I went to Ireland. That was in 1968 when Ireland kind of just. <laughs> but there were things in Ireland I would never have seen if I'd stayed at Western. I was in Derry in 68, so you can imagine what it was like then. Mm -hmm. And I got a different kind of education then. And, and, but I think Western, when I look back on it, allowed me to have this balance between creativity and and an excellent education. I published my first poems here. I probably published as many poems on page five as <laughs> anyone at that time. I published my first book here. I met great writers here. Uh, I had everything I, I wanted here. And uh, I just couldn't stay here in 1968. I, I read Jack Kerouac's On the Road, and I said, I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm out of here. <laughs> and I came back two years later. and. and and I was ready, almost ready to come back. Yes? Um, you've, you've spent a lot of time living in New Brunswick. Mm -hmm. uh, how, does, how has the uh, um, environment of both English and French language informed your writing? Je pense que c'est très une question très très intéressante pour moi. Je commence à écrire en français. Et ça, pour moi, c'est incroyable parce que en école secondaire, j'ai échoué complètement. Mes exams français, oui. Et soudainement, je commence. Suddenly, I started writing in French. And I just, 
I love being able to kind of break out and to discover that part of Canada. Um, uh, in, that I found in, in French, the great poets of Quebec and New Brunswick. And I think it really changed, changed me. It also kind of opened me up to the world. I remember having a fight with Al Purdy, not a physical fight, because I never win it, <laughs> but uh, I kind of a verbal fight with him, saying, you know, you've got to get out there, and I was about 22 at the time, <laughs> and I said, into the world and, and you know, discover other, other cultures, you know, the Spanish and French and so forth, right? And of course, Purdy wrote those beautiful those poems. But I think we have to discover other cultures, like Spanish and French. If you have French, then you can get Spanish very easily. And there's a, a real excitement about learning another language. Uh, and I really began to love French. You must always be ready for the totally unexpected in life, you know. Um, I remember I went to my high school reunion and I went and asked if someone if I could join them at their table, like, you know. And I thought, in the 30 years, I would be accepted by now. I'd written a book about the place, and they said, no, no, you can't sit at our table. <laughs> 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 and I, so I went back to the school the next day, and I was there, and I, I went down to the, 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 the hallway in the basement, and I thought, here I am back in grade 9. It's 1962. And that's where I failed typing. Got, got 28. And that's where I failed English. How is that possible? I failed English. And this is where I failed... What was the other one? English, French, and typing, yes. <laughs> and there's where I had my French. So. I thought... It was like the wall of shame, you know. I just, I, I thought, what is going on? And I just, I got, I had to get out of the hall very quickly because it was 1962 when the teacher was going to yell at me and accuse me for taking somebody's book and send me out of the office. And I thought, oh no, here we go again. And then I went upstairs and I thought, my books were in the window, the vitrine, and that's 2010. And I walk in and there's a woman with my books from the historical society. I see that I had interviewed them on the farmers, and I saw my painting about Emory. And I thought. Yeah, those two things coexist, you know? And when you're a kid, you're always gonna say, I, I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna show you, you know? <laughs> yeah. and, and it's out of the failures that you really, you really uh, learn something. Yeah, well. place, <laughs> yes. The heart of the sunrise, I see a brand new day filled with the laughter of the children who have come here to play to dance beneath the skies and crawl upon the earth to enlighten all our hearts.